Hey everybody, uh, running a, just a couple seconds late. We had a, little, a couple technical glitches, but we're, we're caught up now. Uh, welcome to the Storytellers. Uh, I forgot to run my little countdown, so uh, everybody out there gets to drink because I've had a, uh, a mistake already. Um, tonight we have a, a, a really great artist on uh, to talk about his career and storytelling, uh, the wonderful Lee Weeks. Uh, Lee and I go back many, many years because we were students together at the Kubert School. So let's give this old boy a big hand and welcome him in. Hey, Lee. Hey, Graham. How you doing? I'm good to good. see you. Yeah, it's good to see you, pal. How's everything? We, we go back. We go back more years than I want to count. <laughs> I was trying to do the math, and I think it's like uh, uh, 38, 39 years. This this fall will be thirty eight years. Yeah. 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 I, I was in the yeah. fall of eighty three. Uh -oh. Yeah, you, 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 you were, you, you were second year, I think, right? Uh, I think we got to go back to the 83. Oh, really? Yeah, we got, we got that reverb. Uh, I did, I did, man. It's my fault. It's... <laughs> I'm learning this. Now the host has to take all the blows. I'm just learning this there, stuff. Better? Hey, brother. I'm with you. Yeah, that, that, that seems good. I'm a uh, dinosaur, speaking of all those years. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, fans on the show, you know, they, they made a drinking game every time I, like, when I first started, I'd, like, knock myself out of the stream. <laughs> the stream would be up, and I'd, I'd have to get back in real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know. 2021. <laughs> So let's uh, let's uh, tell uh, the folks about um, what drew you to uh, having a career in storytelling. Uh, most of us didn't come in it for the money because there wasn't any when we came in. <laughs> so there was a passion. It was a love there. And and yeah. what was the impetus for you that drive or, or that that thing that aha moment where you said this is what I want to do. Um, I, I knew pretty early on, but I, I knew it in stages. Like I, I knew I wanted to do it, but I didn't think it was an accessible dream, a pipe, you know, pipe dream kind of a thing. But I, I knew very early that I wanted to do this. And the biggest reason early on was I had an older brother that I adored and looked up to in every way. And pretty much everything I loved as a kid, he loved first. So it was more that I wanted to be him. And... Um, uh, somewhere around, I, I, I liken, I, I've actually pinpointed an issue where I feel like the hobby of, of comics kind of, I, I, I adopted it as my own. I'm like, okay, this is mine. I mean, it had, probably had been for a while, but that first Busama run on FF, uh, and, and, and I think the first, first comic I got that was my, I had four brothers, we shared everything. So the first one I remember that was like mine that I got was FF 112. Oh. Even, though even though I've been around them for years and had them, you know, going all the way back, you know, right. my, my brothers collected, you know, the first comic in my house. I know was, well, now I'm going to forget if it was 23 or 24 amazing Spider-Man. It was one of those two, my oldest brother. It, it was a, a, the one I mentioned before is my second oldest brother. Right. Uh, my oldest brother brought it into the house somewhere in the mid sixties. I don't really remember that, but well, that's a good one. All Ditko. Oh, that stuff. I mean, and that's the stuff. It was the Ditko, the Kirby, the Busema. Yeah. And then after that, uh, Cole and Adams. You know. Yeah. We, yeah. we were really fortunate to grow up with that stuff. So, and my brother was a great storyteller in every way. I mean, we think about what the art of storytelling is important, not just in telling the stories we tell, but in teaching and just. The, the act of the art of communication and my brother was a grandiose figure who kind of you know when he walked into the room and uh and so i just always uh loved that but then just the bigness of the stories and how there was such a portal to escape some of the things that were going on you know just it was just something i really loved doing very early on i i actually published a comic book in the third grade uh, on, uh, I, I drew a bunch of little strips and my, this is actually, not kidding, my third brother, I didn't plan to do this, I'm going through the family, 
Um, <laughs> but he uh, he took those on on copy paper. We called it Xerox. What did we call it back then? We didn't call it. We didn't call it Xerox. There wasn't even Xerox then. Uh, a mimeograph. Mimi what's that? Mimeographs. That's what it was. So he the took it up to the junior high school, they had, and he was able to mimeo them off for me. Yeah, yeah. And I cut and collated and stapled and took them into school and sold them for like two or three pennies a piece. And I think I made a couple bucks. But, yeah, that's uh, cool. So you, 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 you know the publishing game a little better than that. but <laughs> I always remember and my, and my, just, to get, just to get the fourth one in, my little brother, when I would do, I got these little uh, – started getting these blank hardcover sketchbooks when I was 11 or 12 and I would fill them up with drawings and I was kind of messy with the coloring. And, uh, so I would have him, he was my colorist. Yeah. It's amazing. So how did you find out about, uh, obviously, you know, you, you were probably drawing through high school and, 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 and grade school and all that kind of stuff. People told you you were good. And at some point you found out about the Kubert school, uh, as, as an option for us to learn the craft of, of, of uh, comic book storytelling. How, how, how did you find out about the school? I'll tell you mine, and then I want to hear yours too. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I, I know exactly how it happened. I, I actually got out of the, the hobby about the time the new X-Men started. Between Once I got into junior high school, between sports and, and other interests that teenage boys are interested in, right. I just kind of fell out of the hobby, and my brothers were no longer around, so I, 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 um, my older brothers. Um, so I went through a couple of years of junior high in the first two years of high school. So four years, it, uh, that's a blink today. But back then, that's like a couple of errors of your lifetime, right? Oh, sure. And when I was a junior in high school or entering into my junior year in high school, uh, I grew up in a little town in, in, in Maine, 2,300 people. It's actually a city, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, uh, the first comic shop in the state of Maine opened up in August of 1979. I think it was that month, or maybe a couple months earlier of 79 when I was going to go into my junior year. And in between, uh, I was playing football. So if, in between double sessions, we had a two or three hour break and a friend who had graduated the year before said, hey, and he was a huge comic collector. He said, you got to come down to the comic shop. I said, comic shop, what's a comic shop? They said, well, they, they you know, so we, I, I started to see the ad for the Cuban school and those stories, but that was such a reawakening. Now, when I, when I got back into the hobby here, I really got back into it. And I was all, always drawing, but I drew different things. I still would draw some superhero stuff. Mm -hmm. I still love to draw Spidey. I loved drawing Spidey as a kid all the time. But uh, I, I learned about it then. But to me, for at least so many things happened in this three year period. That store was only open for three years. I, I met a couple of writer friends. Uh, one of them wrote my very first job. One of them wrote one of my favorite jobs. They, two of them have written two of my professional jobs. And uh, and then a third guy I met through the main comics club that used to meet there occasionally went to this place called the Kubert School. And when I heard that he went for a year, I think he was in. The, I think he might have been in the second class just for one year. Um, all of a sudden, this ad from the comic books went from being. You know, because ads in comic books were X-ray glasses and two men submarines and and, and seven foot Frankenstein's. I did, didn't think it was real. So when I met someone that actually went to the school, I'm like, you're kidding, it's a real place. So that was another piece that went into it. And then a couple of years later, some really crazy stuff happened that that led to me going there. But it was a pretty circuitous route for, for a few years. Who was the guy that you knew that went there? His name is Mike Dudley. And those guys from there's a core. There was a core of six or seven of us. And the store was called Duck Soup. We're all grizzled. Um, <laughs> a pal that invited me down to the store sadly passed away in his early fifties a few years ago. He was just lived just a couple houses down the street from me. We did all kinds of crazy stuff in the summers, but way before that. And you know the two two big families, and we were. Um, he was just a great, interesting person and and such a, 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 a great ambassador enthusiast when it came to comics. But the rest of us, we Zoom every Sunday since since COVID started. We have an hour Zoom chat and I've actually invited, uh, I actually invited Anthony, the, the president and owner of the Cuban School in a couple of weeks ago and he came and hung out with us for an hour. Oh. It, was, it was really a lot. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun to see the guys just for, you know, an hour, but just check up on each other. One of them actually is 
one of those one of those buddies is, is going through COVID right now. So we, we were zooming with him and he's he's really, you know, under it, but he's he's doing good. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So did uh, I answer your question? <laughs> it, 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 that was a great answer to the question. Uh, How about you? How did you find out? Uh, sort of the same way. I mean, I think I saw one of the ads uh, in the comic books, um, and I knew who Joe Kubert was. I, I wasn't into into um, uh, the war comics or Hawkman, uh, but I did like Tarzan, uh, and I and I knew his work. And you know, the the uneducated, you know, it was always like uh, I always thought it was kind of sloppy, and uh, it was you now. You know, it just it didn't appeal to me the way that somebody that was slick like John Romita was, you know, or or Kurt Swan or or John Buscema or somebody like that. You know, uh, it wasn't until, you know, I, I actually grew up and got some knowledge that I realized what a genius Joe Kubert is. <laughs> I, I think we all go through that, though, right? I mean, most yeah. of us. I didn't know who Joe was when I saw the school, which is another reason why, you know, we had all every kind of comic book you can imagine growing up. Mm -hmm. We used to go to a, a, a place we had uh, in the summer. It, believe me, it wasn't a – everybody has a camp up in Maine. You know, there's so much water around. So it's a very simple place, but with a big uh, wraparound uh, porch. And we just spread the comics out. And there was the war comics, the, the Richie Rich comics, the Mis House of Mystery comics, and all the superhero stuff. But the variety, it was just so much, you know. I was just re-familiarizing re myself with the intro to your – Monster Island, and they're talking about the need for fun and oh. stuff. And it, it, it makes it makes me think of that. Just how they were, they didn't talk down to people, but they were all ages, and they were just a lot of fun. A lot yeah. of fun that kind of variety and so many different kinds of story. Whatever kind of story you wanted to read, there was right. something for you to be able to read. I'm gonna focus on it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, uh, it's a shame that uh, the comics today have have just taken a real nosedive in in that it's they're so similar. There's so much of the sameness of it. Uh, that there's not a lot of choices, and I'm talking, of course, of, uh, of the um, the big publishers, the big two. You know, there's plenty of independence and stuff going on, doing their own thing, and and that's great, yeah. uh, and is necessary because you know the corporations that have bought those two companies are just driving them into the ground. <laughs> I'm not sure we, I'm not sure if in the long run, if that can be creatively, you know, I, I, maybe they're, I, I'm sure that things can come along to, to revamp and, and, and uh, I mean, cause there's certainly periods going back the last 30, 40 years where there've been an injection of new ideas. And I remember that, 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 that period that I got back into comics, there was already, I only learned after the fact, I'm gonna to try to slow my speech down. Someone warned me that I talk too fast. So, uh, um, you know, near implosion or there was an implosion right in the late seventies. Yeah. In that late seventies going into the early eighties, just those formative years leading to my going to the Cubert School. I, maybe it's just my own emotional remembrance of it, but, that was a fantastic period with a lot of innovative stuff being done. The advent of the graphic novel, some of the first uh, independent companies, Eclipse and First and Pacific. They were doing some pretty interesting things. I yeah. loved it all. You know, the, the shooting stuff from pencils with, uh, you know, Gene's uh, uh, Gene's work on ragamuffins and and right. and, and uh, Nathaniel you. Dusk. I loved. I loved Nate Dusk. Yeah, but I just remember a lot of cool things happening then. So. Hopefully, we can have another reinvigorating period like that. Yeah. Well, you know, I think I think some of that is here. You know, now uh, because the the paradigm has shifted. Absolutely. Uh, before you needed you needed publishers to do this stuff, and right. now you can do this stuff yourself with the internet, with with uh, uh, crowdfunding. Uh, you can get your message out. You can get your product out uh, directly to your fans, and it's it's an amazing time. Um, uh, to be creating comics, I think. You yeah. Know, a lot of opportunities. Yeah, they're just, and, and it seems like uh, more cost effective than ever to put the material together. Um, just the, the op yeah, like I said, the options are great. Um, I, I just still have such a fondness for so many of those, those major, you know, uh, the, the corporate characters. Yeah. 
a handful of them. And, yeah. and a couple of them that I would have liked to have had a, <laughs> a nice, good shot at. Uh, I, st I still want a good shot at the FF someday. Yeah, that's what you I've know. always pitched about. But the FF that I know, you know, I just, I yeah. just, it, it's purely about revisiting, you know, childhood stuff. But uh, sure. What was your What was your favorite stuff growing up? Was Was it? It was. You said Ramita. Uh, yeah. My my initial uh, influences were Ramita, Buscema, uh, uh, Kurt Swan. You know, I think those were the three big ones for me in, in the beginning. And then, you know, as I got exposed to more and more stuff, uh, I, you know, Kirby was the same way as Kubert for me, is that, that his stuff was sort of ugly, but it was powerful, you know. Uh, the first Kirby I had ever seen was a copy of Fear, number two, like mm -hmm. 1971, something like that. It was a reprint of one of the old Tales of Suspense uh, collections and all that kind of stuff. But it had this great Kirby cover of this guy uh, you know the camera is down at, at in the sewer and the guy's running towards us and there's this big creature who's busted up the road and and he's reaching down for this guy and i just thought it was just brilliant you know uh and powerful and scary and you know so like my first uh impressions of kirby was you know fear scare you know because yeah. it was just you know that this giant thing that seems so powerful and the guy seems so helpless and i just loved it you know? Yeah, I, I probably similar for me. I, I like Kirby. Again, my brother loves Kirby, so I love him. But I probably have more fondness of uh, Busema and uh, and I just adore Ditko, um, and and love Bermuda and <laughs> just just all of it. But Kirby's definitely one of those that the more you know, the more you appreciate. It, it, for me, for me, it's like the more I've learned. Like I I did some Hulk stuff about. 15 years ago, maybe I can't believe that's that seems like yesterday. Yeah. But, um, I, and I went back and revisited the, the Kirby origin. I just could not believe how good it was. Yeah. Like nine panels on a page and still so dynamic and the little things that, that he would do. And, and then, you know, I see those Kirby collectors, you see that no, no, I mean, inking is a tough thing and it's tough no matter to get two people to think exactly you know think the same way but you miss a lot of this you don't think of Kirby's being subtle but there's there's a lot of subtlety in those pencils that I, I don't think always got captured you know and, I would agree yeah really good draftsman and uh, those he, he very cinematic too uh, yeah. like he would do you know triptychs or uh, progression panels of a sequence uh, and not just of like a banner changing into the Hulk, but but little things, you know, like uh, Rick walking away in, in, into the into the background, you know, uh, to to um, uh, kind of showcases loneliness, you know, that type of thing. Walking away from the camera yeah. in the foreground, which is stationary, and these characters walking away. Yeah. Uh, you would do that in like a progressive panel type stuff, and it, it's just you know you weren't seeing that in DC Comics at that time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, my, my, that's one area where I didn't cross over as much. My my brother was a big DC guy, but I don't remember reading a lot of, I mean, certainly Superman and Batman, but I, I don't remember reading, oh, oh, and then as we get to the early 70s, certainly Green Green Lantern. I loved, loved Neil's work. And uh, so with, <laughs> the EC stuff was not part of, uh, your world growing up, or I never heard of him until I went to the Hubert School. Oh, yeah, most of the cool stuff I've been introduced to outside of the Marvel stuff. Mm -hmm. I got introduced to after going to the Hubert School. I I knew of EC, but I didn't really know what it was, and it's because um, my route into comics went through monsters. Uh, I was a monster kid, and I would read monster magazines, and so there was always articles and stuff that was peppered with illustrations from the EC comics, you know, like ghastly Graham Engels stuff, or if it was a sci-fi thing, they would they would use uh, um, Woody's stuff, um, and so that's how I first saw this, and I, I realized how amazingly beautiful the artwork was, and I wondered what it was, but I really didn't have access to that material, you know, mm -hmm. like like you can, I like can get now. But yeah. you know, at Cubers, they had great libraries of all this stuff, you know, and you could, uh, you, you could 
you know, really open up your minds to this uh, this great stuff that went before. Eddie, Eddie running the library. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> downstairs. Down, uh, you, you've been back, to, you've been to the new place, right? Uh, once, uh, when they had opened it, they, they just opened it. There was a, a small reunion that they had. Uh, this is around 1980. I was there. Six, something like that. You were there? Oh, okay. 86, 88. I remember because I remember I met a lot of the guys that came before us that I had heard about, but had never met like Yates and Bissett and those yeah. guys. I think they were there. Mm -hmm. yeah. They were. Yeah. 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 It's hard to believe that that year, you know, you feel like it had this storied history. It was like the sixth or seventh year of its existence. It was right. we've been there for a blink before we got there. Yeah. So time is such a strange thing, and it gets what, more strange by the day. What was the first year it opened? Was it 76, 77? It's one of those two. I, yeah. I think all of 76, but I'm, I. Yeah. Not positive. We were there in '82, right? I was there. Uh, you, you, did you go all three years? No, uh, I went one year. Ran out of money. Uh, took a year off. Went back for a second year. Ran out of money, and never went back. <laughs> that was the year I, I was there for your second year. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So you were in '83, '84 was the year I was there. '83, '84. Okay. I think yeah. did you did you graduate high school in eighty one or eighty? Eighty. Yeah. So you're you're a year year ahead of me. Okay. I, I just look like I'm thirty years older than you. You you you've aged a lot better than me. But <laughs> I just I just look like I graduated sometime in the sixties. But uh, but I think we're born in the same. I'm I'm, I'm an older kid from my class, so and that birthday cutoff thing. But yeah, so. I wish I had appreciated it. I mean, I think I did appreciate it a lot when I was there. Mm -hmm. I wish I'd had a better um, sense of balance socially, so mentally. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't. I didn't have any governor on anything. You know, and I. I didn't. I didn't know how to balance work with. With. Uh, so I. I ran out of steam after one year, and I thought I was done. I didn't think I was going to pursue it anymore. I, I just, for the first time in my life, I, I stopped drawing altogether for about seven or eight months. Didn't do anything, not a thing. I couldn't look at the white paper. <laughs> and then... Uh, back to Maine? Uh, <laughs> after your first year there, did you go back to Maine? No, I didn't. I stayed in, actually moved the day after the school year ended. I moved from Dover to Rockaway. Oh. And uh, roomed with a couple of guys for a few months and then... Uh, and then, uh, yeah, then kicked around for a year. Worked at a convenience store, the Seven Eleven off Route Forty Six. Oh yeah, and which was honest to goodness, it was the best thing I ever could have done. I I needed that period as a young guy in his twenties who didn't know what he was doing. I remember you and I driving up there one night to get chip witches. I don't know the ice cream sandwiches with, that had the the um, uh, the chocolate chip cookies on the outside. The chip oh my gosh, there. I have no recollection of that whatsoever, but I'm, I believe you because my memory is <laughs> terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember you and I driving up there to go get those one night. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was an interesting year. I, I, and the, 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 I think I see a lot more of that balance uh, encouraged now. I mean, because there were guys that were just us that did this school, right? They didn't, they were learning as well, how to run a school, how to be a school. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of those lessons of the years, as I go back and now I teach occasionally at the school, um, it seems like there's more attention to those things, that there's there's a there's a, a, a social support. You, you know what I'm saying? I, I just, it feels, it feels health, potentially healthier. Right, so <laughs> you know? don't fall through the cracks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because it's a lot of work. I mean, uh, I remember that uh, they really worked too hard. Um, you know, I, I tried to hold a job 
uh, at one point and I couldn't hold it because I couldn't do my assignments. I was loading trucks for UPS at midnight and, you know, I'd get home at like two in the morning. I'd sleep a couple hours, go to school, come home, bust my ass trying to do my assignments and then go out. Uh, that lasted a week. <laughs> Did you work with anybody else at UPS from the school? No, no. I remember somebody else. I think he was also in your class. Irvin O'Neill. I haven't thought of that name in 20 years. It just popped into my head. Irvin O'Neill. I think he was. I think he was, he was an animation student, so he was probably more out in the. Oh, okay, out in, in the, the portable center, working with Mill. Milt Neal. He was a character. I, I only met him a couple times, but he seemed like a. He, he, one of the times I met him, he said, "You got to come over to the house, take, go, take a ride in my helicopter with me." So, <laughs> That's right. I forgot he had a helicopter. <laughs> yeah, I didn't take him up on it. Yeah, yeah. That's probably a good idea. Yeah. So. <laughs> Who was your biggest influence? Uh, uh, before you got to the school, who was your biggest influence? Was it Busema? I th I think it has to be. I mean, I. I Speaking professionally, I mean, the biggest influence after my brother was, uh, it has to be Busema. I, I just devoured him. And there's something, I, there's a panel, and maybe I've reconstructed the panel in my head, but there's a panel in that first run that, that was not anything super significant, but I just remember as a kid, as a whatever, what I would what have been, nine or 10, when that came out. The CFF? Uh, yeah, FF, his first run. So, like, somewhere right around the negative zone. I think it's in the negative zone, actually. But just where Reed is stepping out from behind a, a, a rock on floating, floating on a chunk of I, – I just remember being I, – I didn't know how to articulate it as a child, but I can remember that feeling of there's something different. When I look at these other comics, why is – you know, there's just this solid blue form, but I could feel – I mean, in retrospect, now looking back on it, I knew there was something about, I was very attracted to that sense of mass and weight that he got with, you know, not a whole lot of lines, or whatever, but just, and and there's an elegant little cast shadow dropped across it, and I just couldn't take my eyes off it. And, but that, yeah, the thing, now being able to articulate more of it, but still probably lacking, um, I just think he's such an incredible blend of illustrator, cartoonist. He never stops being a cartoonist to me. Like he, the essence of the cartoonist is throughout all of his work, and yet it's so this other thing at the same time. And just, just uh, a madman with the pencil. You know, maybe not the most innovative. There are other people I look to for some of that, but real solid. You know, some when I say solid storytelling, I, I'm ready for the person that's going to say, "What about those times when they had to use the arrows and the hey, the guy drew five or six pages a day?" You know what I mean? He was trying five or six pages. That we can't even. I I can't comprehend that. Yeah, I, I can't comprehend to produce that much work at that level. You know, just incredible work. But yeah, those guys had to work like that to support families. Mm -hmm. uh, they had to develop styles that they could uh, master and, 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 and do quickly. You know, um, uh, I had Howard Chaikin on and he was talking about um, Gil Kane one time uh, when uh, Michael Golden sent in the pages for that uh, um, Avengers annual that he had done. This is the one that introduced Rogue. And the pages came in and Gil was looking at him and Gil was livid. He was so angry. Not, not angry at Michael. Uh, but angry that this guy could do this good a work, you know, um, under a deadline, you know, uh, and it, it, it just, you know, I thought it was an interesting perspective that um, the old guard guys, you know, the, you know, they, they put, they had passion for their work for sure, you know, but they know, they knew the limitations of time and speed and all that. And then you get rights and who comes in, and and Adams too, and um, and and uh, uh, Jeff Jones, and, and the whole that whole group that came at that time in the early seventies, and and just kind of turned illustration into comics. Um, the old guys that were the cartoonists that came from the Kniff School and the 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 Mac Ray Boys, and you know all those guys, 
they're like, you know, they didn't know how to how how to approach this, but the illustrators couldn't make the deadline, so <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah, tell me about it. You know? Yeah. I've spent the last several years trying to become more of a cartoonist. Um, I also just think there's a lot more life in the drawing I, when, the, when, the, when you can venture over to the, you know, just venture into that cartooning realm. There's just more room to bend right. and express. And uh, yeah, it's it's really what's exciting to me mm -hmm. you know, about doing this. Yeah. It's, doing it. I, I've talked about it since I was in school. We had, you know, about learning to do it with less, but I didn't have the temperament to actually do it. You know, too many times get seduced into trying to do every little, you know, whatever. Right? Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, it's being able to do more of it with less is, is a real and then at times, you know, there are times to really um, just render the daylights out of something for for a purpose, right? For a purpose, right? But, uh, yeah. Not to just dazzle, you know. It, it has to serve a purpose. It slows it down. Mm -hmm. It slows down the story. It become if it becomes, oh, look at this! You've taken me out of the illusion. This is all an illusion. We're we're magicians. And, and uh, we've got to just keep the illusion going. And this concept of, uh, I, I was looking at a uh, uh, Instagram the other day, just a drawing that Ron Garney had put up and uh, just really loving the way he, with single lines, you know, had this hand in the face, a guy getting punched in the face. And, uh, um, and I was just like, that's, those are the, he's drawing what the lines are doing less concerned about what they are. And it doesn't mean that what they are is still there. Mm -hmm. But it's like, I want to be concentrating on the doing in the line rather than the, the, the form's got to be there. So you, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, when Toth is doing all those wonderful things with just a few little lines, it's not at the, it's, he's not sacrificing form. He's just not being chained by it. In, right. Right. He's getting right to the essence of what everything is doing so that you get maximum emotional impact. Yeah. Did you ever hear the story of Toth? Uh, uh, you know, he was a huge fan of Roy Crane's work, and he wrote Roy uh, and, and sent him some of his uh, uh, samples. And Roy wrote him back and told him that um, he needs to declutter. He needs to take out everything that doesn't further the story. And wh what's left? Draw the hell out of it. That's what he well, called. In, in one of the Toth books, and I have several of them, so I can't remember which one it is. The opening, I think it's right in the very beginning. I had copied and made 11 by 17 of a list of do's and don'ts. And those are two of them. I think the, what you just described were two of them. So he, he, he even used the word clutter or declutter and draw the hell out of it so that he, he was, uh, he was uh, speaking crane there. Yeah. That, one, that's one that I keep promising myself I'm going to, and I know you've been a Crane fan forever. Yeah. And, uh, um, and, and I don't, it's just finding the time, but I, I, he's one I really would love to study more. Mm -hmm. you know, and I don't get to do study very much, mm -hmm. but cause there was a period in the late 80s, right around 1990, where I, I was my big break getting Daredevil. I just felt like I had to do something. I would. I felt my work was ugly, and I needed to. I needed to learn something. I needed to. I felt like I wanted to break it down and build it back up. And I started devouring some Terry the Pirates, Kniff. And I, and I, I, I always say this, but no one would look at my work and go, "Oh, Milton Kniff." But I'm telling you, there's so much Kniff. The the way that I thought about spotting blacks and using shadows and framing and stuff like that, mm -hmm. would definitely. And, and, you know, people would say, what happened? Your, your work changed so much. And, uh, but they wouldn't attribute it to, to that type of thing because it doesn't look stylistically like right. that. I, mean, I, oh, I just love that school. I could definitely see it in your backgrounds. 
you know, you, how you spot blacks in your backgrounds and stuff to pop figures out and stuff. Uh, very much in that Sickles, Kniff, uh, Robin school. Yeah, and, and just simple things like the way they would create patterns and the wrinkle of a, a garment just to set it up. It's just the way to separate items. And, mm -hmm. and uh, a, a beautiful thing that I just love that he does that now you, you'll, you'll see it all through my pages. It's just keeping, even when there's heavy shadows, if you don't need shadow on the face, he would keep the face nice and open, clean, and then use a, a, a simple shape of a, the, the head casting a shadow down on the body. And it just draws the, you know, it's just such a great little way to frame your things and get things a little busier in all the other places. But those areas of focus just, just pop out so, so nicely. But yeah, I was looking at Sickles the other day, a panel that, which guys posted that I had posted. I didn't post it because I posted it, but it's it's a this sim, simple panel of there's no people in it. It's just a sand and trees and huts. It's just one of the most beautiful panels, and it's all these different values, so clearly defined, all in line. Mm -hmm. just, just a different way of doing a line for the this hut, that shadow, the wagon the trees, the sky, and he just establishes this very clear set of values and texture patterns. And it's, it's emotional. I mean, there's nobody in it. And it's like this emotionally composed. It's just beautiful. It's really beautiful. I'm a huge fan of Frank Robbins work. Um, I actually prefer it over Kniff um, just okay. because Robbins is a better writer um, than Kniff, in my opinion. Uh, less heavy-handed uh, okay. and, and and a little bit more um, dramatic uh, in his storytelling. I, I I always remember this one Robbins sequence where this bad guy had a bunch of people. They're on a boat, and uh, inside the galley there there's a table set up, and there's all these people sitting on either side of the table with the bad the head bad guy, you know, big bald dude. Um, no offense to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, sitting at the end of the table. And then these waiters come in carrying cloches, you know, like they're going to serve the dinner. And they put the cloches down in front of everybody at the table. And then in the last panel, all the way he angles it is so amazing. All the cloches are raised, and underneath each cloche is a pistol, a handgun. Wow. And I'm like, holy shit. I got to read this next Sunday. I got to, what the hell is going on here? It's like, they're going to do like a Russian roulette thing at this table and everybody's got a pistol. Maybe one of them's loaded. Maybe one of them isn't. And wow. just the angle he chose to reveal that was just so amazing. Wow. That does sound amazing. And that's another one that I, I don't know enough. I, I still feel like after all these years of doing this, that, that, that I, I feel like there's so much more to know and to, to, to learn not just about the craft, but about the, the craftsmen, the people that have done it. Because Frank's another one that I'm, you know, honestly, I'm more, for, and I know he's had this whole career before he did this stuff. But my introduction to Frank was the, the cap stuff he did in the mid seventies with uh, yeah. <laughs> Light Chain. Right, right. So that's, that's probably, that's a hurdle to get over. Yes. Um, but I know that, it, you know, it's no problem now. It's just, again, it's just the time thing. I mean, I mean, but yeah, those guys were just so good. They were just so good, and it was yeah, real, real craftsmanship. The uh, the strip guys were amazing. Um, I know Butch is huge. Uh, he's a huge strip fan, and uh, he's got collections of like clipped out um, Sunday pages and stuff that he's always posting, which I, I love to see. Yeah, but uh, I love when his stuff comes up on my feed for that reason because I. And, and I wouldn't be able to tell you who they are because my memory's terrible. But I've seen so many names that I've never heard of. And I'm like, yeah. how can I? How can there be this many guys that were this good that I've never even heard the name of? Sure. But they were just so exceptional. Just solid, solid stuff. You know? Yeah. yeah really. Yeah, he's, he, he posts some great stuff and, and produces some great stuff too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Butch yeah. is so awesome. <laughs> yeah. I got to get him on the show. Talk to him too. Yeah. So, so um, what are you working on right now? Um, I'm, I'm in between things. I took a, I took a hiatus. 
-hmm. And uh, I actually just finished up a, a Batman black and white story that I'll be, uh, that will be out in, I guess, April. And um, I wrote it. I wrote it and drew it. It's a Commissioner Gordon story. And it's the first thing I'd done after taking a, a pretty lengthy break I, where I did just covers and, and um, stuff, but I'm, I'm, I'm on the hunt. I'm on the hunt for a, for a project for mm -hmm. something that I, and I, and I have a couple of ideas that have been floating around in my head that I, I just haven't been uh, brave enough to take the plunge that you've taken. Um, but things that I, I, that one idea in particular that, I need to explore more and uh, and just jump out into the deeper end of the pool. You should. You'll make a killing. Uh, you, you have a huge fan base. People love your work, uh, and uh, you get it out there. It's it's. I'm not going to lie. It's hard work, you know, because of yeah. all the hats you have to wear. But yeah. the payoff is there because you own the product now. You're not giving it away to your ideas and stuff away to a corporation. You know. When did you start writing your own material? When did that happen for you? The first, the first uh, DC sale I made in 1983, I wrote. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, it was. It was for uh, Mandola's class. It was uh, a class assignment. Wow. Yeah. So uh, the, my, actually, the, my first published work was something I wrote and illustrated. It, it, it's funny because my first story that I I drew, I co-plotted. I would say. I don't know if Tom would be offended if I said that, but it, it was a story based on a, a real life incident. So I was very involved in the crew. We pitched and sold the story. So it wasn't quite writing it, but I'm reminded when you say that of how I thought that's the way it was going to go. And I wonder if it could have, you know, because it, it, it was something really cool, right? About just being, at, having a hand in every, every stage. And I did write a little something a few months after that, just a little gag strip, mm -hmm. wrote all things. But I know that each time I have taken a, a tiny micro plunge, and I've written a few stories, a couple of mini series. Mm -hmm. um, it is the hardest, but it is the most fun, the most satisfying to have. To not only you know, I always think of us as comic artists, as puzzle solvers. You know, you get a you get a script or a plot, and it's a puzzle. And it's a, how do I make all these pieces fit so that everything? But then, as the one who's coming up with the story, you're writing, you're creating the puzzle. Mm -hmm. You're creating the puzzle, so it just gives you another layer. And I've always suspected I, I, it's probably not entirely true, but I I think there must be an advantage to uh, like I love intimate storytelling. By that I mean that will go in and out of tight details where you get the, what, what you just described with the cultures to mm -hmm. me that like one of those moments where you just come in on some uh, uh but uh frank you know the cinematic stuff that frank did that stranko was doing maybe a little some of it a little bit before um and uh, as so many other people i mean i fell in love with what miller was doing when i was uh, getting serious about the journey Mm -hmm. And then he had, did with Mazzucchelli. Um, yeah, that was great. And the, the intersection, of how the words and pictures, it became, that's when it started to become apparent to me that they, they're really like two melodies in a piece of music mm -hmm. that you, you, you don't want them doing exactly the same notes all the time you want them. And sometimes they travel in a parallel, and sometimes they crisscross, and, because sometimes the, you know, Larry Hama tells us, or, or is it Larry that told the story? Adam, I think it was a, a GI Joe that Larry and Adam Kubert did together, that was intended to be a totally silent book. And if I've got this wrong, forgive me. But Larry will straighten it out, or Adam will. And when they turned it in, it was all great and everything. And somebody higher up said, "We can't have that. We can't have a fully silent book." And Larry's like, "What am I going to do?" And apparently, he went back and came up with a way to write a whole other set of business, like a, a second story that paralleled the story that was being told in the art, which is phenomenal. To me, that's just so cool. Yeah. Like, yeah. I didn't know places where plot and where, where script and words 
come together and intersect in a moment that punches you in the face. Mm-hmm. I think there's an advantage to the single vision, you, you know, unless you really got to, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I, and no, I mean, I think it's tough to write. I think it's really hard to write. I just think as a writer to write so visually that you're into that kind of detail where you can have those moments, unless you're thumbnailing it, I, I, I don't, it seems like it would be tough to do. To, to have that kind of real specific, intimate, uh, you know, intersections of script and, and picture that like Frank does so well and, and other guys. But. but I think guys like that, guys that are artists, uh, and from, uh, Kurtzman used to do that, you know, thumbnail uh, his ideas. Yeah. You know, particularly the more complicated they are, the easier it is to work out. If you are an artist, you can you can just break them down and move them around and and get it the way you want it. You know, um, uh, that's why you know I I I think that the the cartoonist, and I mean that in the term that the the writer artist is the purest form of the art form. And uh, it's uh, I I just you know I always admire those guys that write and illustrate their own product, their own work. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I agree that it's a, it's it, you know the Eisners the, um, yeah, it's 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 true. Yeah, I mean some guys are are, are artists that write, and there's writers that draw. You know, um, I've always thought of myself as a writer that drew. You know, uh, and I know there's a lot of artists. Um, uh, or, or there's a lot of writers that wanted to be artists, but they couldn't, you know, uh, many of them, you know, that they, they, they tried to be an artist, but they couldn't, but they became very good writers, you know? Um, and then there's the others, you know, the guys that, uh, you know, they, they break in as artists because it's a little bit easier to break in as an artist because you can show them product immediately. You're not, you don't, you can, you can look at an artist's work and go, oh, this guy's fantastic. He's going to be perfect, blah, blah, blah. A writer, that requires you to actually read the stuff, and that takes yeah, time. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's a little harder, for, I think, for writers to break in. Yeah, and more so today probably with, I mean, uh, it seems like a, a lot of people won't even look at unsolicited stuff or whatever for, you know, concerns for um, charges of swiping or, you yep. know, whatever. Yeah. And, and it makes sense, you know, with all the, but. Um, with all the lawyers out there. <laughs> what's that? With all the lawyers out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They take the fun out of everything. <laughs> yeah. But I, I feel like there's been a, a um, that person, that writer person has lurked in me and I, out of, uh, I think really, I don't, I think it's just insecurity. I think it's on one hand, it's insecurity about this. What if it's not as good as blah, blah, blah. And the other hand is, well, I get kept really busy, you know, with my drawing. It, it's almost like, um, I think even going to doing the independent stuff, you know, when the, it's, uh, what is, what is it? Fear of loss is greater than the desire for gain. I heard that. 30 years. <laughs> I was stuck with me. Some sales training guy said it. Well, you definitely have the talent to do it. And if you could just, uh, you know, get that fire in the belly, you'll be successful doing it. There's no doubt about it. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. Um, I, when, is, when is the next Monster Island? Uh, well, I'm working on other things right now. Uh, I've, I've uh, you know, I, I published the Chinoo, uh recently. Uh, I'm doing. Um, Alien Alamo, which we talked about, uh, and I'm interconnecting a universe uh, that I, I'm not doing sequels in my publishing. I'm doing like not even spinoffs, but they're all interconnected, um, and characters will show up. Uh, I even I you know I did a series called Joe Frankenstein for uh, IDW, and Joe Frankenstein gets mentioned in the Chinoo so that people know that these characters still they all intersect in the same universe. The Nolan universe. Oh my no. god. Yeah, exactly. How, how big is it now? I mean, you also got the Sunshine State too, right? The, yeah, oh, yeah, do you, I do. Do you still do that? Do you still do that? Oh yeah, yeah, I still do Sunshine State. That, how, often do, how often is is that daily? Once a week. Once a week. Yeah, once a week. That's a that, ton of. That's the. 
that's the most fun I have, and I can't monetize it. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I can't make any money off Sunshine State, but I still do it. I do it every week because I just love to do it. it it's so much fun. It's a, it's exercising different muscles that I don't use. Oh, it's uh, great. It looks it looks terrific every time I see it. Thank you. I did a I did a, I tried to tie it in with the chenou. Uh, I was I used the strip as a, a a launch pad for the chenou, and I had my characters talking about it and and yelling at me for for forcing them to do uh, uh, product placement and stuff. <laughs> it was so much fun. Yeah. I don't get any respect from my characters. I can tell you that. <laughs> so how, how has, um, is it okay to ask how you've been doing with COVID? <laughs> oh, how, how, yeah. How are you doing with all that? I'm, I, you know, I, I haven't gotten sick. Um, I know a lot of people that have, yeah. uh, but they've all, you know, had various stages of it, uh, or I should say levels of, of of how bad it hit them. My daughter had it. Uh, she's 25, and she was sick for you know the full two weeks. Yeah. My uh, one of my best friends' parents that were 90 and 93 in Florida had it, and they're fine. You know. And my 80, 83 year old aunt in Michigan just got over it a few weeks ago. Now she's uh, in the hospital with pneumonia. Like a, a month later, she got pneumonia, unrelated to the. Yeah. Uh, but she, yeah, we've had several people from our church that have, that have gotten it. Yeah. I mean, right. it's out there, it's, 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 you know, it's just, and it's weird how various people get, uh, how it affects them. Yeah. It's a really, really strange. And my daughter started her residency up in, in a hospital in Rhode Island. So they are. She's probably working hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and just just got the just got her second dose in the vaccine the other day, but that's not oh. comics. Right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about the. Well, you know what's happening in our world. You know, yeah. There's no avoiding it. We're not at conventions. Uh, you know, uh, it's affecting all that kind of stuff. In fact, I was supposed to be down in Sarasota next week uh, at CGC to sign a whole slew of books. Um, and that got canceled. Um, so that now they're going to ship them up to me, uh, to sign, but I was kind of looking forward to, you know, going down there, you know, my, my old state and seeing friends of mine and stuff like that. And, uh, it just wasn't, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and really, I mean, in a way this is happening because of it, right? I have a microphone in my studio because, yeah. Because I ran out and got a bunch of stuff, thinking, "Well, we gotta, we have to find a way through this." Yeah, but, but we will. I mean, it's, but you know what? Here's here's the plus side of things. Um, I'm saving a ton of money. <laughs> you know, uh, we're not going out to eat. You know, yeah, you know, you know, we're not doing a lot of the stuff that we were doing. So you know, um, we're 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 actually saving money. So uh, maybe when all this thing breaks, you know, I can. We can uh, hop on a plane and go down to the Keys and just chill out and do some fishing or something. <laughs> You're a big fisherman, right? You fish a I lot. Fish, yeah. 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 That's that's yeah. my piece for uh, uh, like in the summertime. You know, when the weather breaks here, I, I love to just go out. You know, in the sunshine by the water and just chill. Even if I don't catch anything, I'm like I'm still happy. Well, one more non-comics thing I have to say. I I'll, I feel terrible if I don't mention it. Congratulations on the bills. <laughs> <laughs> Go Bill. They look great. They look great. They do. They do. I, you know, I don't want to jinx myself. Baltimore's a tough team. Um, and we'll find out Saturday night how that goes. Yeah. I'll be rooting for them. Oh, thank Root, you. Root, rooting for the East. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, you know what, Lee? Uh, we got some people here that probably have some questions for you. Why don't we Sure. Check? And see what we got. Do I need to be? Uh, well, I'll pull them up on the screen. Oh, okay. Great. Uh, we got some hellos. Monster fan says greetings to Mr. Noel, Mr. Weeks, and all the chat. Uh, oh yeah, this is a good idea. Leave a like and subscribe. Ring the bell for all notifications. Yeah, if you could, gang, you know, subscribe to this page. Um, 
it really helps it grow. Um, I would appreciate that. Um, fellow says, hail to us. Great. A lot of the back and forth here. Uh, I think you both got your start doing new universe. Uh, uh, yeah, close to it. I mean, we both worked on some of those new universe titles. Uh, new universe was, uh, I did, I did a year and a half at eclipse and then took those pages to Marvel and got an, a, a, did about a year and a half to two years doing new universe stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I did, uh, just a few issues of that stuff. It, I wasn't big into it myself, but you know, it's a stepping stone. I, I think the f first five years of my career, other than those first two jobs I did with my friend, I took whatever was offered. And, and after about five years, I was ready to quit again. I just, I was so <laughs> unhappy, so, so unhappy. Not that it, it doesn't even mean that it was all, you know, it was some of it was really great stuff, but if you're not, it's not, you know, you want to feel like you're the, the pilot a little bit more. Right. You know, I, I, said, well, what, I never, I, for five years, I didn't ask myself, well, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. What would you want to do? Just, uh, just rely it to, again, shy and insecure, rely too much on hoping that they would ask me to do the thing that I wanted to do rather than going after the thing that I wanted to do. Right. Because there's some really good stuff in there. Just, uh, I just wasn't taking charge. Mm -hmm. Some of the first stuff I did was for Eclipse. Uh, that's where I met Chuck Dixon and Bo Smith and those guys and uh, Tim Truman. And uh, I really loved doing the stuff at Eclipse because they were uh, there was very little uh, oversight in in that you weren't micromanaged. Uh, we were working in genres that were non superhero. Um, um, pulpish, noirish type stuff, stuff that was really in my wheelhouse and I really enjoyed it. And then when that started to end and I started getting jobs at Marvel and DC, like you, they were like, these jobs were like, oh God, you know, I, I guess I got to pay my dues, you know, <laughs> with these guys, you know, but they weren't, you know, the, the, the things. Yeah, the Eclipse guys, like the first thing I did was in uh, uh, Tales of Terror, which was, had been. Tales of Terror too. It had been, um, what was it at, it was at, was it at Pacific first or first, first, first? Eclipse picked up these two books and had to change the titles. They had oh. Alien Worlds and, uh, oh, yeah. but what was Tales of Terror called when it was, I don't remember, but they're not the original titles of the books, but when Eclipse took them over, they had to, for some reason, some legal reason, I think they had to change the titles. So I love those anthology books. Yeah. Uh, you Bruce can really Bell wrote a ton of stuff. I did a story with Bruce early on. He just he, he used to do a, a lot of that material. Yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, I I think the first Lee Weeks book I ever saw were Magnus Robo Fighter versus Predator and Daredevil 300 Last Rights Part 4. Yeah, I, I left Daredevil to do Magnus versus Predator. Oh, did you? Well, I turned it down first. I'm, I'm, and then I thought about it over the weekend, and I called Mike Richardson back and and uh, thought if there was going to be a time to leave the book, 300 was the right issue. And, um, and, and it seemed like a fun opportunity. You know, there was, a, there was two issues. I got to pencil and ink myself and, and it was a totally different milieu. It was, a, it was a, a channel, you know, a little bit of Mobius tried to believe me. I'm sure it was feeble, but mm -hmm. it was a, it was a it was a good it was a good change. It was the right time to do it. Yeah. Jim Nielsen wants to know uh, what you think about Kubert's Tarzan. What do I think about it? Unbelievable. I'll tell you what I think about it. <laughs> oh, I don't have the one. I, I have the other one of these. I can't show you the other one of these because it is so beat up and shredded. The green and one. Still, 
and I still uh, pour over it. Mm -hmm. There's a thing. I mean, I've told this several times. There's a thing. I'm that, that other one of those treasuries. I'm going through it one day, probably for the 150th time, and I'm reading this sequence where Tarzan's got to carry Jane on his shoulders and climb up a steep cliff, and then he, Joe does those beautiful narrow vertical panels, and it goes in for the close, gets for the mid shot, and and then there's the really long shot. I cannot tell you how many times I've read that. Never a hitch. Never stop to wonder. There's nothing that would draw my attention to pull me out of the. And one day I'm looking at it, I'm like, that panel with the long shot where they're climbing up, mm -hmm. it's like two, I can't get in front of the camera, it's like a couple of vertical lines for the cliff and a dot. I think he took his B6 speedball pen and just went, you look at the dot and you see two people. Right. It's just a dot. It might, be a, it might be a slight, tiny little extra bump. So maybe it's a double dot. Yeah. Double dot. But... <laughs> Because of the sequence, you never think it's anything other than those two people climbing that. And I just, to me, I just love that kind of a thing that you can fool the person into because of what comes before and what comes after. Mm -hmm. I guess the answer is I, I like to use Tarzan. <laughs> Sorry. That's the, that's the Return of Tarzan book, the green one, the big one you're talking about. Yeah. Um, there's that sequence where he, uh, uh, the boat blows up and he's laying on like a raft and then he looks up and he sees a, a, a piece of land and he jumps off the, the, the raft and swims into the land. And that sequence is uh, what I talked about before is sort of like a triptych of um, uh, very cinematic as he jumps off and he swims and he gets up on a land and he finds out, you know, he's, he's, he's in his father's old cabin or that's the piece of land that he saw. Uh, that sequence is just amazing to me. And, you know, and I've said before in other shows that there's, there's like, there's, uh, three guys that really could, uh, give you a sense of depth in their work, like the distance and, and size and mass. And Joe Kubert is one, Ross Andrew is another, and Nick Cardi. Those guys could, they could make stuff look so far away. And, and if, like, like in the Kubert one, we're talking about where he, I think the scene where he climbs up with Jane and they get on top of this gigantic rock to look at the palace wall of uh, where, uh, where yes. Wall lives or whatever it is, the gates there. Yeah. And, you know, he just draws these gates like with, with like you said, maybe a lettering pen or something. He just puts a few lines here, a few lines there and stuff. But then the stuff in the foreground has much thicker lines and, and more detail and, and gray tones and stuff. And so that separation of distance and shape yeah. is just, you don't see that. It's just so yeah. amazing. And, and the other thing I love about that thing of t taking this little abstract mark that isolated by itself, you wouldn't know what it is, but because it's in the proper sequence, it, it touches on this, uh, you know, one of these things that I really try to drive home in my own work and, in, and when I teach is the idea of the, the more, that um, I can engage the viewer to have to participate in the storytelling. Like they have to infer that. That's not just given to them. Right. So there are different ways you can you can give a viewer an opportunity for in, inferring something. And I do this little demonstration where I draw a series of circles. And each time I draw the same circle, I first it's just a circle, and then I add a shadow under one side so it goes from two-dimensional to three-dimensional. And then I add a cast shadow in the third one and fourth, fifth one, I might do a couple different things, like a line behind it for table surface. But on the last one, when I draw it, I it's instead of adding something, I go to that lit side, of, top side of the ball and erase it, knock it out so that it opens up. And of all the ones, it, it's the one that just pops. It's just that's a tiny, simple little demonstration, but that's the one that the person looking at it has to finish it. Right. So I'm a big believer in I don't want to do this to you. I want to invite you to come do it with me. And all the opportunities, whether it's in the drawing mm -hmm. and leaving stuff out so that, you know, I, 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 um, I, I'm gonna, I want to go down a path and I don't want to insult anybody. 
but uh, uh, but to leave stuff out, yeah. you know, whether it's story to, in the story itself, the moments yeah. where you've laid the groundwork. So the you know in a Hitchcock movie, so the person looking goes, that means so and so is the you know you're not spoon feeding it, you're putting right. it there so that the connection has to be made. So we're just you know, um, and every panel gutter. Every panel gunner is that empty space between two static images that the reader is asked to infer something. If you just show them everything that's happening, um, I just think that that's a that's a magical place that that panel gunner to, to try to take as much advantage of as possible and stretch mm -hmm. and try to get the viewer because those are the things that you know when I'm watching a movie when I'm reading something or whatever those are the, that's when I get excited that's where the life to me in the drawing is is where the person looking at it has to has to kind of participate that's my spiel i do it almost every time so <laughs> hey that's good that's the educator in you yeah let's see uh what else we got here keith says both you guys are two of my favorites out there well, thank you keith thanks Great. keith love the hat Oh, look who's here, Elizabeth Breitweiser. Great conversation between two, between great and brilliant men. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. And she's uh, a brilliant artist, she and her husband both. Uh, just, you know, for you guys that are following my uh, Alien Alamo stuff, Elizabeth is coloring, or has colored, the uh, wraparound cover for me. And uh, when I unveil that in about a week and a half, you guys are going to flip. It's amazing. She is unbelievable. I've worked with her for a few years on some Batman stuff. She's yeah. always the first person I ask for. And um, she's just incredible. Sergio! Sergio. <laughs> the Surge Master General. <laughs> the Brazilian Bear. Hey, brother. Good to see you, pal. Uh, somebody says, uh, Jeff Butler says, it was great to meet Mr. Weeks a few years ago at C2E2 in Chicago. He was exceptionally kind. Saw him give a brief art tutorial to a grateful or young grateful artist. Uh, you just got me on a lucky day. I'm not, I'm not kind. <laughs> Do you guys like comic conventions? Graham, I hear many creators say they don't, sadly. Uh, I was doing a lot of conventions uh, just before COVID started. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I enjoy them. Do, I try to pick conventions based on. Um, a lot of play, times where it, where they are, you know, if they're places I want to go and see. Um, but f conventions are a lot of work and it does take you away from the work at hand. So there is that too. So that's how you, you, you gotta kind of, and it takes you away from your family. So you have to, you have to kind of balance it out a little bit. How do you feel about that, Lee? Do you do a lot of shows? I, I think the most I've ever done in a year is maybe like 10. There's certainly no, nothing, you know, Neil Adams would laugh at my yes. convention schedule. Um, but uh, usually it's six or seven. And that's a respectable I time I started going, because I stayed away for about five years, I think. Mm -hmm. When I started to go back, I'm really grateful. I, I don't know. I mean, it is hard work and you're so exhausted, but I, I think on balance, I love it. I, I think I, I absolutely love it. I, I would take my, I haven't done this so much the last couple of years, but I would take my, because I, I also do some magic. I don't know if you know that. I'd take I, my cards and my coins with me and I would I would just, you know, if somebody came out with little kids or whatever, or not even just little kids, I'd do some, do some magic, which I, you know, I think there's a lot of overlap between what we do and the sleight of hand stuff too. But, uh, and then the ones where you, can, like you said, it's tough being away from family, but the ones where you're able to travel with, you know, like I've I've met your wife at, at Pittsburgh. Yeah. It was a, we were in Pittsburgh together, right? That's where yeah. I met mm -hmm. Ju Julie, right? I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so when we can do that, it makes it a lot nicer. Tish and I had the unbelievable honor of uh, we were, I went to Brazil a couple of years ago for we stayed for ten days. The show was I think four and a half, and it's the most phenomenal, most phenomenal experience that's cool incredible they love their comics i'll tell you they yeah. love 
love, love, love their comics. Oh yeah, south yeah. of the border. Uh, I did a show in Mexico City, and it yeah. was crazy. And <laughs> there are, are they're they're wonderful. I gotta ask you when you, know, when you did that show, would you get? Um, well, I just I'll, I just say it. Uh, one of the things that I adored is how many people brought up less than pristine condition books, some yes. of them pretty beat up, and mm -hmm. apologize. Like I'm, sorry, I'm like, you're kidding me. Don't don't apologize for that. This is wonderful. You're reading that. I much rather sign those than. And and I think one of the things I said at the end of the show was I saw exactly one of those windows all in four, you know, with 270,000 people, 300,000, whatever it was. And I saw one of those, you know, where they cut the windows up. And I'm not discouraging people from doing that. I, you know, if you can do that, great. Oh, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. To protect the comics so that you just sign in that little window. Mm -hmm. I saw one of those, but a lot of comics readers and, and just super incredibly warm and sweet people. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was. It, I it had some wonderful experiences. So was it La Mole? Did you say you went? You, where did you go? It was La Mole. Uh, La Mole is that how you say it? Sorry. Um, yeah, I'd like to go there. I'd like to. I've heard great things about yeah. that one as well. They take you to the uh, to the uh, uh, the temples, the uh, Aztec temples. Yes. Uh, uh, it's 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 really cool. Um, that, it's a neat show. Yeah, that sounds. It. I'd love to. I'd love to go see that. I was supposed to go a few years ago, and something came up, and I couldn't. So, uh, Lee, any character or property you would like to work on but haven't? Now, Lee had already mentioned the Fantastic Four. Uh, is, is there any, uh, any I, other? I, I've, I've worked, a, done a little bit of, very dabbled in Fantastic Four, but I, I, if I could do a, a run on Classic FF, that would be kind of neat. Mm -hmm. uh, the the one major character I, I that I grew up with that I always wanted to do mentioned earlier Green Lantern the the uh, Hal John Stewart uh, both of those that that I uh, grew up with that was uh, none of this feels as urgent as it did maybe fifteen twenty years ago mm -hmm. but so, uh, this this period that I've taken a break I've done a lot of um, covers and smaller things and uh actually i took a month to just sit and draw just to have fun drawing and some of the things that would bubble up were interesting and i i renewed a thought my, i remembered my fondness for space ghosts recently <laughs> and, uh, that kind of stuff i mean i love those hannah barbera you know yeah the, sure the herculoids the johnny quest stuff the, and this one might even be terrible i don't remember them super but just the memory of of uh, what it felt like as a kid, Mighty Mitor. I just I loved all that stuff. That's, that, that's a great way to rekindle your passion because the reality of this business can it can beat you down. Uh, there's there's many people that have been under the tread and uh, you know didn't come out on the other side in this business. Yeah. Um, so if you really love it and you really have a passion for it, it it's necessary to to rekindle that passion that relight that that pilot light every once in a while and for me it's not going out and seeing what's coming out today it's going back and seeing the greats that i admire and 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 see why and this uh sort of comes up to what this uh this guy wants to know right here uh about studying other artists work how do you go about that exactly and the answer, uh, I'll let Lee answer in a second, is to deconstruct the work. You know, you look at their stuff and you say, well, why is, everything's a decision because it's a blank piece of paper to start with. So everything that goes down on that paper is a conscious decision. So you have to deconstruct it and figure out why. Why did he make this choice? Why does that resonate with me? And why did that choice not resonate resonate with me? Why, why, why do I think that looks bad? You know, those are the kind of things that you do to, 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 Break down your idol's work, figure out what you can take in and what what you want to leave out, you know, so that you don't just become a clone of that that guy. You just take the things that work for you, and then you take the things that Lee Weeks does, and I'm going to add that to my uh, my arsenal as well, you know. A perfect answer. I, I don't think I could. No, seriously. I mean, I'm just listening. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. That was just a. 
perfect way of describing it. When, you know, when I was a few years in the business, I, there's a lot of Kubert look in my work. Or, but people say, well, because I went to the school. It's actually not true. I didn't really try to draw like Joe or anything like that when I was at the school. What happened was two or three years in, four years in, while I was beating up that Tarzan book, <laughs> uh, I remember doing exactly what you're saying. And just looking at, I would look at my panels that had so many lines and look at his, Joe's, that had so few lines. Like, why does it look like there's so little in my drawings and look like there's so much in his? How does he take those few lines? And I knew the concept of saying more with less, but what is it, exactly what you said, just deconstruct the breakdown. And I actually sat down back then. This is, you know, in my 20s, mid-20s. I sat down. And just on, on the side, I just actually copy just to see what it felt like to draw a face with that few lines. Mm -hmm. what did that feel like? Because I think so much of the urge to put more in is like, uh, it comes out of almost like a, uh, I keep coming back to the word insecurity, but I think it is that. I think it is that. Like I'm not doing enough, I'm not doing enough. And it takes some real boldness and confidence that you know what you know to strike those very simple, and now it, you know you do it enough. Again, there's no substitute either for just putting the time in. You know, the more you get familiar with something, the more, you know, I'm sure you've. I, I'm gonna bet. Um, I, I would bet if I was a betting man, I bet a lot that you love looking at people's roughs and thumbs and stuff like that, right? Sure. Yeah, because you see the thinking. You see the, that's when you get a chance to see their brain kind of opened up. But I, th I thought you're. I'm just trying to buttress what was already a perfect answer. And right. you did a you did a perfect job. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it will look like. This I don't know what it, the next time I do it will look like. I mean, it it be just just reading and looking and trying to absorb and hoping that I remember some things. But, did but, did you ever uh, when you were a kid try to copy somebody's work? Um, there's two things for me that uh, two pie two pieces of art that I copied ad nauseum over and over and over, and I could never get it right. And, and I always, you know, it just looks so easy the way they drew it. And then when I tried to redraw it, it never came out. One was when they revamped Superman in 1971. They had an ad that used to run in all the DC comics. It was um, uh, Superman 71, and had like a couple panels of like. Superman 1938, and he's, you know, got kryptonite. Superman 71, and he's eating the kryptonite, you know. Uh, and they, they did these, uh, Superman in 1938 works for the Daily Planet. Here he is at, uh, you know, uh, GRZ or whatever the, uh, the W, I forget what the TV station he worked for when he became a news reporter. Um, and, but the main drawing was a drawing by Kurt Swan, just a classic shot of Superman, you know, um, with his arms and legs akimbo, you know, his, his, his arms on his, on his waist like this, standing there, and he's got this determined look, but sort of a smile, too. And his cape is, is, is hanging down behind him. And it was drawn by Kurt and inked by Kurt. And I drew that shot, because that, to me, is the image of Superman, that kind of standing up there, I, you know, throw out me what you got, you know, because I can take it, you know. And his face looked like a man to me. It didn't look like a boy. Looked like a man, and I tried to draw that a million times and never could get it right. And then the other one was a scene from Captain America 114 by Johnny Romita. It was one of those aha moments where you know you uh, you think all hope is lost and Sharon is about to get killed by this robot thing, and then the shield comes in on a small panel off panel and smashes into this thing's face, bounces off, and then there's this great like semi splash shot of cap and bucky running towards us and the shield coming back to him and he's catching it he's like reaching over and catching the shield like this and his, the foreshortening on the legs as he's coming towards you it's like god damn i can't draw this thing. <laughs> i must have tried a million times dude are there any of those things that you had i'm trying know? to think if there were things that i revisited over and over again i i, I don't know if i had the uh um stick to it just to do that uh um but i can remember specific things trying to copy and being enamored with and what year did the Steranko hulk annual come out you know the atlas shot of him 
That's that's a 70, 71, isn't I it? Was, I thought it was 68. Oh, is it that late? Well, it was probably old. In my, it was probably a little old, but I remember uh, that was one that I copied and, and being really proud of it, you know, excited that I did this thing, showed it to my older brother. He was really looking, why is the Hulk got so much hair all over his body? Because I tried to do the feathering, the muscle feathering, and it came out looking like hair to my brother. And I just remember the cr feeling crushed afterwards that I had, you know, thought I had nailed it. But I, it, it might have been after '68 because that's when the distribution changed and Marvel yeah. was able to publish more comics, and so they broke them off. Tales of Suspense or Tales to Astonish became Submariner Number One and became Hulk 102. And that was 1968. So. It's, I just looked it up. It's 1968. Oh, okay. Yeah, you were right. I have all the useless information in my head. <laughs> and I, I also, it makes me think of my, my older brother got into oil painting as a 12, 13 year old. And he had his easel set up in our dining room. And I, I remember some things that he, you know, he paint portraits and paint. Um, but he did a, my favorite one he did is uh, two, two of them. He did, he did a small painting of, uh, Don McLean's, I can't get thumb or, on the, the, uh, or maybe it was a piece uh, with the American flag painted on it. But, oh, uh, it was the, I think it was the Don McLean American pile. I yeah. Think. Um, and then he did Avengers four, the cover to Avengers four as an oil painting. Oh, it's not uh, I don't know, that was, uh, really. Crazy that. went up and touched it before it was dry. Gave him gave him some some a place to that he had to fix. His little brother was getting in the way. So uh, this gentleman, leg kick one, wants to know Lee on classic FF. Who would you want as your writer? Um, probably my friend that. I did a, I, that first job I ever did was written by a friend named Tom Field, one of the duck suit guys that we meet on Zoom. And he wrote some other stuff after that. He said, I still send him stuff to read over when I just did the other day. I had to write a forward for a book and uh, had him look it over for me. There's another friend in that group, Bruce Canwell, who's gone on to, you know, these Amer Library of American Comics, the big, gorgeous hardcover. Mm -hmm. well, he's, these guys that we he he's one of the editors he works with Dean Mullaney on those uh Kniff and the Sickles and the and uh, and he's a great writer well he wrote back in 97 we did a he had a Robin story and uh we I pitched it I, I loved it when he pitched to me I pitched it and then I remember that I remember that author. and it's honestly it's the one story that doesn't get reprinted enough that I have more people come up to me and, and writers and editors say what, and it, it's seriously one of the smartest stories I've ever had the privilege to draw. He, and it's the first comic book he ever wrote published. He had, he, he had uh, some uh, close calls in the eighties that should not have been close calls. They should have been slim dunks, but you know, there's a lot that goes into anybody breaking in. It's not about, He's just a super smart, talented guy. I would, I would love to get a shot at working with him. Cool. Before, because you know, a lot of years of simpatico. We know where we don't see eye to eye exactly right, but there's a lot of mutual respect, and I just think he's one of the best storytelling brains I've ever had the privilege to know. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, it would be uh, Chuck Dixon. We've talked about this for years about doing. Yeah. The Fantastic Four, because he loves the characters. I love the characters, and uh, obviously we can work well together. So uh, yeah, that would be my that relationship has a huge, you know, just means a lot. And you guys have what? I mean, how many things have you guys done together? No, oh, for thirty for over thirty years, we've been doing stuff together. So yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Dr. Mass says, I have to say, I don't look at comics the same as I did before I started watching the storytellers. A lot of things I didn't really look at. Well, that's good to hear. I always want to open eyes to new things. That's cool. Uh, absolutely. I study the roughs and then compare them to the finished drawing. Pencils are my favorite to study, says Ari. 
SDA says hello. Here's a question for you. Has there ever been any work where you thought the colorist ruined what you were trying to convey? This is a question for both. And that's the place I wasn't willing to go earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's happened. You know, it's it's happened. Mm -hmm. I, I had it happen on a, the first, like, four issues of Hawkworld. And I can't blame the colorist so much as uh, there was an issue with the printing. Yeah. Uh, they were doing something different. Um, I think they were trying to, like, I think they were taking copies and the guy was painting them and the separations got mixed, missed, messed up or something like that. There's something where there's, like, it was this garish colors. This yellow was, like, yellow and purple and all these crazy colors. There's no nuance whatsoever. And, and it yeah, I talked to my editor, Mike Gold, and you know he said that there was a problem with the printing on it. So we can't blame the colorist for that. But yeah, those those first few issues were like, oof, God. And then back in the '80s when we had that flexographic plastic stuff, oh, a lot of graphic. And you don't know who to blame there. Just, the production was just horrific. Yeah. There's one thing, a general idea that I I, I, I will address, and it's. Um, you know, it's it's just one of the things I, I again have loved about working with Betty and Elizabeth on the, the Batman stuff and, and and Brad on on a bunch of Brad is color a bunch of cover Brad Anderson covers. Um, you know, when the computers came in, uh, uh, this is covering old ground. I'm sure a lot of people. This discussion has gone around a lot, but you know, when you all of a sudden you get a million, trillion, gazillion, quadrillion colors. Some people just want to use them all, <laughs> you know? and yeah. sometimes less is more. Um, but as as I, uh, one of the things that's just personally frustrating to me, hearkening back to the earlier part where I talked about what, loving the inference, the place, the places where you can in, imply. I'm sorry, imply something, leading the reader to infer. I hope I didn't say it backwards before. Um, a lot of that happens in the forms. You know, you would you you imply forms. You don't draw them all out. And to me, those forms, as that experience as a young child looking at Busema, that's what was happening there. And I was seeing things that really weren't drawn in there, but you could feel the forms. Mm -hmm. So when those smaller internal forms are not all rendered, and then they come back rendered in the colors. Because they saw them, because they were implied. It's like, no, 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 you just ruined my magic trick. You know? <laughs> the, the, the magic trick is that they're there without being there. So if you make them there, you've just undercut the magic trick. Right. And, and I just, I, you know, so that that would be hard to see. It's like, oh, just, I mean, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it just, it would, you put, like, you just said earlier, everything you put down, you do with intent. It's a decision, it's a choice. So you make these choices carefully to try to, and then something comes in, it works against it. It just, it's a little hard to, and that's always going to happen to a degree in collaboration because no two people think sure. exactly alike. I mean, I've, I've worked with inkers that are such better artists than me, but you see things, it's like, I would have done that differently because it's, you're just two different, two different minds and two different sets of eyes and you see things differently. And the flip side of that is uh, with collaboration. Sometimes they they do make it better. You know, like they'll bring something to the table. Uh, uh, they'll, they'll make a color choice where they'll apply some color theory that makes something pop. Uh, maybe because it was you know there's too much going on, but with the color they made it pop. Or or an inker you know puts something in there that you didn't you know actually draw uh, pencils and it's you know. Yeah, you know. absolutely, Williamson. Captain Texture, you know, he would he wouldn't necessarily add um, things in the drawing, but he would if he saw an area that was a little weak, he would, he would put a little texture in there, a little build up a one of the, one of the beautiful cross hatchings or whatever. He just saved my butt an awful lot of times, and, yeah. and, and keep mentioning Elizabeth or or uh, it, so, there was a in the uh, Batman annual we did. There was a particular pen. I mean, many examples, but one in particular where Bruce Wayne is uh, alerted to Catwoman's being in the mansion at some point, or someplace, and 
he leaps over the couch to go chase him down. And what I had drawn was very, very minimal. I mean, it told the story, but what came back was, it was just so, it was so good. You know, and, and it, it, simple choices, but really s- simple, thoughtful choices that she did something with the, uh, the negative space between the beams of light and stuff and right. were, that just made that panel so much more than what it deserved to be. Oh, wow. And they're, and they're honestly, they're probably, uh, I think in some ways, and maybe you would disagree with this, I'd be interested to know if you do, we're in like a golden age of, of comic book coloring. I just think that there's some brilliant, brilliant uh, color artists out there. A lot of it working, working in independent stuff. But they're just, you know, Jordy and and uh, Laura and Elizabeth and um, and then you know some of the old guard guys. But it just seems like there's there's a what I miss though are those deep, rich blues we used to get on those FF covers back in the. Where did that deep rich ink go to? We don't, I mean, they don't seem to be able to get it. Do you know what I mean? Those issues that from 40 to 80, the, the Spidey 2, the blues were just so blue. In the interiors? No, on the covers. There was, there's, a, there's an intensity in the actual physical ink on the, the color ink I'm talking about, yeah. on the covers that just doesn't seem to be attainable today. And I, I think it's something in the actual physical material of the, the inks, I don't know, maybe. Yeah, or, or the paper that they were using. Yeah. You know, uh, whether it either absorbed it or, or it uh, didn't, you know, and it laid on there and became brighter. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. The, the problem I have with coloring today is that um, when it's done right, like you said, it's it's unbelievable, like the, the names that you had said, but, but there's a lot of over coloring. There's a lot of um, uh, they, they, they don't want to theatrically color in a way th- to separate forms. Uh, so everything becomes modeled. They model every shape and everything. So you, your foreground, middle ground, background, all of it, bec- it loses that sense of depth. Like we talked about Nick Cardi and, and, and those guys being able to capture all that depth. And with the flat dot colors they used back then, um, you know, they would put like a really fine light green in the background for that forest or whatever it is that's in the distance. And that would separate from the heavier colors that were in the foreground. And that worked so wonderfully for the print medium that it was. And today, the sky's the limit, you know, but because they have so many tools, they want to use all those tools and they want to make every little panel look like a painting. What it does is it just flattens everything and it makes the page a big muddy mess that's hard to look at. You know, there's no, no flow to it. And, you know, those things just jump out at me and I, I'm like, oh, God, I can't read this, you know. One more, one more thing about the modeling in particular is that, you know, form is, is treated. I mean, black and white artwork is, is very different than color. You know, we create form very differently because you just have black and you have white. I mean, you create the grays through other other means, but if you're not, unless you're using washes or whatever, but you build up areas with detail, with cross-edge work. So the way color defines form is very different than the way black. So sometimes if you've got an artist that uses a lot of black shadows, and then the colorist tries to over-model it, or you really got to be careful about how much modeling at all you do. I mean, there are guys that do it. Dean White is phenomenal. Dean White is phenomenal. Um, but if you don't do it just right, those languages clash. They're two different dialects, the black line dialect and the color dialect. And if they're both trying to do the same job, especially mm-hmm. the same space on the same form, it's like, no, oh, the black did it. The black did it already. You're trying to redo something. And they just they end up just bashing heads, and it looks really, really ugly. Yeah, yeah. Other yeah. than that, I don't have an opinion, but you you hit it right on the head. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we covered everybody with, who had any questions in here. Uh, a lot of folks, you know, saying hi and uh, uh, like. Uh, let's see. 
just like to scroll by just to make sure I didn't. What's the next movie you covered? What's that? Oh, uh, on Saturday, yeah. the Western Roundup is uh, The Professionals. I don't know that one. Oh, God, you got to watch it. Uh, uh, Burt Lancaster, Woody Strode, uh, Lee Marvin, um, Robert Ryan. Um, it's, 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 it's a great testosterone film. <laughs> I just saw The Killers for the first time ever a few months ago. Which one? Lancaster's first movie, The Killers. Oh, well, yeah, that's a good that, one. That's right. I got the title right, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah based on a Hemingway book. Yeah. That was yeah. the movie made with Lee Marvin. I, I bought the set that had both versions in it. Oh, oh really? Yeah, the Lee Marvin version. Yeah, it's a totally different hipster kind of look. <laughs> but uh, I love Burt Lancaster. So the professionals, I, I, again, so many great comics, so many great movies. I I still need to see. I'll look. I'll look for it. Good. Oh, we got a question here. I, I asked earlier, but I was wondering if you had any advice for studying art subjects on your own. Uh, can you be more specific, Gary? What type of art subjects are you asking about? Just throw it down there in the comments, and we'll uh, we can address it for you. Um, yeah, uh, the last week was a tombstone, and uh, I know you like that one. Yeah, I said I wish I I wish I seen that. That that was uh, that was the wide art movie that that year. The other one, yeah. not so much. No, 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 no. That's yeah, that terrific. So, I almost worked with that director a few years after that. Oh yeah. Yeah. The, after I did the Tarzan Predator, I did after I did Predator Magnus. I got asked to do another Predator book. I said oh, I don't want to be the Predator guy. I didn't want to be known as the. And Mike Richardson said, "Well, what can I do to?" And, and, and I, I said, "I'm more interested in the people that I work with." And he said, "Well, who do you want to work with?" And he said, "Don't say Frank. Frank's too busy." So the first name out of my mouth was Walt Simonson. He called him up because we did this thing together. It was a lot of, lot of fun. And sometime several months later. I loved that book, by the way. George Pan Cosmatos reached out to me through his first, his assistant. And then I actually had a few conversations on the phone with him. He was slated to do some sequel to the uh, Christopher Lambert uh, Greystoke. Oh. And, uh, and so we were talking about he wanted me. He, I'm going to do a terrible accent because I don't know what a Greek, a real authentic Greek accent. My impression, my memory is a guy that smoked way too much. Saying, uh, my name is George Pankos Maros, and I'd like you to draw my movie. That's what he said. I'd like you to draw my movie. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the funding fell through at some point in the next year, and it then never panned out. <laughs> no pun intended. No pun on the pan. <laughs> oh, so, okay. So I already got back to it. Such a studying and practicing perspective. Thank you so much for getting to my question. Oh, well, you're welcome, Harry. Uh, any uh, suggestions for studying and practicing perspective? Maybe some books that you would recommend, Lee? Um, one that's kind of covers an awful lot of ground that we got at the Cubit School was the Andrew Loomis figure drawing for all it's worth. It has a nice, you know, doesn't go super hog wild into any one of the topics, but it covers, I remember some really great perspective stuff, important uh, application of perspective, like how to put people at varying depths on a, on the same plane. So they look like they're the right height at varying depths. That was a revelation to me when I first saw that book, I saw that, saw that. So that kind of thing. The other thing just in general about pursuing any topic is, is, uh, just uh, I was just the importance of really learn whatever you're learning mechanically. You know, that's not the right way to say it. Uh, like when you're learning these rules, alongside it, you just want to remember that. It, to me, drawing comes down to seeing, constantly being aware, observing. You know, and all these things we're learning how to do. If you could see it perfectly, you wouldn't need the perspective rules. You know, who's the? I always can. Uh, I'm always going to mess his name up. Jing, the, the Korean artist that draws without any, any oh. has a YouTube channel. 
That guy's I'm, a freak. I'm sorry I'm terrible with his name. I feel like such a schmuck. But uh, I can't Kim pronounce Jung-Ji, Kim Jung Ji, is that it? Uh, but he draws these incredible detailed things without ever putting any structure drawing down yeah. in perfect perspective. And the, uh, he, he doesn't need the rules. He sees it. Yeah. So all the rules are like all these things that we learn. They're almost like support support system to help us get to where we can see it more. But I, I know I try to leap off into the scene as much as I can, especially with the figure work. I think you got to go past the rules to get to the life of the drawing. It has to, it's just on the other side of, of the rules. So study, 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 but also just always work on the, the seeing part, you know, to see it. That's a great way of putting it too. Excellent. David Williams says, Lee Weeks is the man. Do you know David? Do you know David? Hey, David. Do, do you know David? We've met, right? Dave, Dave's a really great artist. He's doing that Bass Reeves book for uh, Allegiance for Elizabeth and Mitch. Oh, cool. Yeah. That, that, oh, that, bad, bad Reeves? What's that? No, Bass Reeves. Oh, you're doing Bass Reeves? Yeah. Oh, I, with, with, is Kevin writing that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. I, I, honestly, when I heard about that one, I'm, I'm jealous of you, David. That would be a, that would be something I would I would, I would have. Uh, it just sounded like a really great, some great material to work with. It really is great. And, and I was trying to make up for it, and so is, and, and and so on, so is me. Uh, so nice try, David. Trying to flatter me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I worked with Kevin on a on a Spidey story. It actually, it was a little little story that was a nice had a great emotional punch to it. Well, you have a uh, you have a request here, Lee. I don't know if you can make this happen. Uh, can you do a magic? Hey, Ruben, Ruben, what do you, what do you think? This is his hat. Is it really? He gave me this hat. Oh. <laughs> Another great Avenger. I've had it for years. I thought of him earlier. I brought the hat over. Like, wouldn't it be something if Ruben showed up? But uh, <laughs> let's see if I can do it. I've got this special two-headed cord. I don't know if I can do this for the camera right. Is it all right? Can I do this? Do it. Let's see if I can get it to focus again. Yeah. I can't get it from. It's it's hard to is it focusing yet? Uh, the, wrong way. the coin isn't. It's not in. It, see, it's supposed to be a two headed coin. It might be easier to see the other side. It's it's heads on one side and the other side. It's a completely different president. <laughs> Look at that, people! <laughs> How awesome is that? <laughs> now, see, when I when I uh, I, I pe people that have seen me are probably like, oh my gosh, there he goes again. But when I get a chance to speak to a new group or I teach, that's if it's not the first, it's the second thing I do because it, I just demonstrated how a comic book works. There's panel one, nothing's mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. There's panel two, nothing's happening. Where the magic happened, let's see if I can do this again. I keep going in the wrong direction. When my hand covers everything for that split second, that's right. the panel gutter and that's where everything happened. But you just had two static images with a panel gutter in between. That's 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 what a comic book is. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Oh man, I love it. I I can never get enough of magic. You know, I just I love to watch that stuff. It just oh, do you really? Yeah, oh, I do. I just it makes me a kid. You know, when I, was, when I needed to escape from the deadline stress back in the early nineties, I I dove back into it. it helped. It was a hobby of mine as a kid. Never went past like my teens, but I got heavy into it and joined the local international, the, they call it the IBM, the International Brotherhood of Magicians. It's one of the two big worldwide organizations. And uh, I haven't been in probably over 10 years, but I love, I love close up magic. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, you go to those restaurants where they get the magicians come in, they come over to the table and they do that stuff. And, and uh, oh, that's what my friend, uh, when I when I was about six months, actually, real quick, Tish and I and the kids 
went to Boston for a convention. We were walking through Faneuil Hall and I saw this magic shop in 93, I think. And I saw this book and it was a book I had seen when I was like 10, 11, 12. And I couldn't afford it. It was too expensive and I had money I could buy. It. I went, wow, I can get this book. And it just set me off. I, I And I, I, a few months later, I just out of the blue, I started going through the yellow pages and I found a magician, called him up. We're friends to this day, Joe Keppel. If you're listening, hey, Joe. But uh, that's what he does. He, he, he uh, He's a close-up guy and he has he traveled all over doing close-up, but he has a regular gig at a restaurant that he's kept for, I think, 20 or 30 years, where every Saturday night you go to this place, you'll get some incredible close-up magic from my Joe Keppel. At the, I, 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 the terminology, you know, you, you're talking about, yeah, he's a close-up guy. The way that, uh, you know, uh, criminals call somebody a second story man, you know. <laughs> Or the way you in the in the opening of the uh, I noticed oh it makes me think of the Monster Island thing when the pilots are coming in there's a there was a little designation a three letter designation oh Rio Rio yeah Rio that's what it was that's what she just made me think of that one. Yeah. which means what again uh, radar it? intercept officer yeah. Those are some great planes you drew. <laughs> you know, when I when I did the uh, sequel, Return to Monster Island, uh, I had a, a quandary because the Navy retired those planes. Which one is it? It was the F, uh, uh, F-14s, the Tomcats. The they retired? Oh, they, they retired years ago, uh, and now they use uh, F-18s. The Hornet? Yeah, and that's yeah. a single-seater. The... Uh, the, the Tomcats were two seaters because the Rio was in there. And so I had to get them in a plane where the two of them could be together so I could crash them back on the island. So uh, there's a there's a, a modified Hornet that's a two seater that they use as a uh, as a radar jamming plane. And so I I, I put them in that. <laughs> I didn't know that about that. I know that they had revamped at one point with all the targeting systems stuff, the, the, the F-14. Um, yeah, that's another thing that's fun about this job. You get to learn a little bit about a lot of different things. I was, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember having to do a helicopter military chasing, and I actually picked the right helicopters that would pursue the. It was just fun to learn that stuff. I'm not, I, I'm not super into this stuff, but I remember a little bit about the the Tomcat, not just from Top Gun, but I also like the, the is the Eagle the F-15. Is that the is that the uh, yeah, that was the Air Force's. Uh, the the I think it's the Screaming Eagle. Is it is is it the fifteen or the sixteen? That's the Eagle. Fifteen. I want to yeah. say. I want. They're all cool. They're all cool. But the F fourteen is really cool. With it. Yeah, yeah. That's that's also one of the ones with the two. The two uh, two engines in the back, right? The two. Uh, yeah. Yep. And they and they spread out and. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's what they used in Top Gun. That, that was the Top Gun planes. Yeah, so I said I know them for more than just Top Gun. It's not just Top Gun, but but I certainly love them in that as well. Yeah. We, we went to the uh, annex for the uh, – uh, I'm not going to remember the name, but it's the Air and Space Museum's annex, which is about 10 miles or so out from the from – the, and I thought since we were going to the annex that it wasn't going to be as – Cool stuff, and it was unbelievable. Wow! All the Apollo stuff. They had the Enola Gay there. They had the the, um, the Enterprise shuttle. Uh, just, just so much stuff. I I I just thought it was well. It's the annex to the Air and Space Museum, and it was. What is the that name? Is really neat. Uh, planes. Gentleman wants to know. He's listening while he's inking. What do you enjoy more, pencil stage or inking? Inking is is a mystery to me still. I mean, I enjoy it sometimes, but I find it mysterious still. Yeah, I still see things that certain people do. I'm like, I just haven't gotten there, you know. And it's not so much the, the drawing part. If I just draw with ink, then you know, I have no problem with it. But there are things you can do <laughs> with the ink that it, it, it feels just out of reach to me. Drawing is just thinking. Mm -hmm. you know, just especially when you kind of pass that warm up place when you're doing layouts, you know, it just feels like an extension of the, the thinking. It doesn't feel like anything. Mm -hmm. Then taking it to a finish, if 
there could, there could be some wrestling matches there for sure. Sure. But. I like the inking stage uh, better because of the very reason you just said. You're not thinking as much. Uh, you know, you, yeah, you got to think, but, you know, the, the foundation is there, you know, and, yeah. and finishing to me is fun, you know, to put those those juicy, bold lines in, you know, with the uh, I just I, I, I love that aspect. I like the inking a lot. Yeah. I, and, I, and I don't mean to say that I, I, I definitely enjoy it, especially when it's working right. I just feel like I'm more on the tightrope, <laughs> like it's a little bit less sure. But yeah, when it's working right, it, it's a, it's a, uh, good question. And, and, and also, I don't know how, how you, I'm, I'm going to bet again, one of these bets, one of these invisible bets that your experience has been similar. Cause I don't know anybody who hasn't been this. I think I'm frustrated with the changing of materials in the last 20, 25 years. Like it's oh. really, and if you have, I, I'm open to anybody recommending another combination of paper brush and ink because I feel like I'm constantly in pursuit of just coming close to what it used to be like. Now I'm starting to sound like, you know, get off my, get off my lawn. Yeah. What's weird is when we were at school, I remember the teachers talking about, oh, this stuff is inferior to what, oh, but this, oh, yeah. they killed themselves over, over this, this stuff today. It's, it, it's yeah. The pen glass, the ink is like, they added up, I think, Tom Palmer told me they added a, is it enamel into the inks? And that's why they clog up so much. Oh, and that gives them the shine too. It's, it's, uh, I think it is enamel. I think it's something like that. It's something. That's what Tom told me. And, 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 you know, it's hard to get clean. It ruins your brushes. Uh, if you want real black, you've got to use those. And I can't stand that. Like usually they give a, the light is, you, it's a re it gives a reflective surface. So if you want them, the the one that I seem to have the most uh, uh, success with right now is although I am trying this uh, Japanese ink that comes in a rectangular bottle. It's pretty good size and not very expensive. But so far I, I've liked. I've only tried it a couple times. But the uh, Dr. Martin's uh, Black Star Matte Finish is is pretty good. Yeah, it, it, it's pretty good and it doesn't beat the brush up. And I don't think it has it lacquer. I think it's lacquer that's in it. Oh, okay, yeah. I, yeah. I, I think that's what it is. Double check me, but but um, enamel lacquer, whatever it is, that stuff that really eats the brushes up and because speedball, I think I don't want to. I, I think speedball has it in it or black, uh, not black magic, but the speedball super black has it in it. It's very shiny. Yeah, and uh, it's a lot of times I find that when you're spreading with a brush. It, it, it isn't solid black. You know, you get those gray tones and stuff in it. And I remember talking to uh, the late Eduardo Barreto because uh, I was at I, uh, some pages of his came back to me and I'd never seen ink this black before. I mean, it was so black. There was no change in tonal quality on any of this ink. And I'm like, Ed, where'd you get this ink? He says he, he was ordering it. He was down in Uruguay and he used to order the ink from Germany. And I don't even know what it was called, but it, was, it looked amazing. Wow. Pelican used to be pretty good. Pelican used to be my go-to. I used to love yeah. Pelican. It was always solid black, you know, and the yeah. speedball to me was always kind of uh, wishy-washy, you know. Well, the regular speedball, but then they had the super black. At least the last time I tried it, it was one of those thick with the lacquer. But that's, uh, black magic used to be black, and now it's... If yeah, the non-black magic Higgins. Yeah, we are trashing brand names. I hope that's all right. <laughs> but it's like it was like gray wash. It wasn't even. It wasn't even like black at all. But the 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 Doctor Martin's is pretty good. But I, I need to get the matte finish because I don't like that shiny, shiny black stuff. I I like to get it is, and and I don't mind for certain things. I don't mind some of the black being a little uneven in fact i think it can add some interest to it but it is kind of cool to see robert campanelli used to ink me on some stuff and uh his stuff's always so clean and even in black when you were talking about uh eduardo it made me think of uh robert inking me you just uh, and uh yeah just really clean flat black but uh, my, my pages are a mess <laughs> now, really are. Yeah. Work? What's uh, that? Do you do any digital work? 
I, I do a, probably almost, there are very few pages that don't get touched digitally. Okay. Um, when I started uh, doing the Batman stuff, um, I just, for speed's sake, and, and some of it frustration, I also have been, uh, my eyes, uh, mostly from dry eyes, it, it just it wouldn't focus real well. So there are days if I was having trouble with that, I would be partway through a page. I say I'm not, you know, instead of walking away from it, starting the next day, I'm trying to be a little more, um, trying to be more professional than maybe I've been at times in the past. And uh, I would just say, heck with it, scan the page in and finish it up in whatever manner I need to finish it up in. So I have a lot of hybrid pages. I try to do as much traditional as I can, but I, I have very few fully traditional, you know, more covers than pages, but they're, you know, pages with touches of, but people look at it and say, do digital, it looks analog. Well, most of it is, most of it is traditional. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. And and but then there are pages that get scanned in that I maybe didn't take some chances that they're finished, and I'll say you know what that needs more, and I'll go in and rework them a little bit because I I don't feel precious about the originals I guess as much as I did years ago. It's really just getting to that you know what the page needs to be at the end. Right. Sure. Sure. Well, How about you? I, are you doing any digital? I went all digital uh, when I did the. Um, um, did you really? I didn't know that. I did. Uh, yeah. I well, I started digital on Sunshine Day. That's where I got my feet wet. Was doing my my strip digitally, okay. but I never had the the guts to to try something more complicated like a comic book page uh, until I did. Um, the Expendables Go to Hell, that graphic novel I did with Chuck and, and Richard Meyer. Um, that was such a labor-intensive project that there was no way I was going to be able to get it done by doing it traditionally. So much reference. I mean, I, I had one panel once that had more reference in it than whole books needed, you know, and uh, I, I needed to be, import stuff. And, and so I tried it, you know, I tried it for that thing. And it worked out really good. Um, I, I did the Chanu uh, entirely digital. I do it on my iPad. And uh, are, you, are you using uh, Procreate? Yeah. For all, all of it. So I need to, again, I need to spend time. I've had my iPad for a couple of years. I've done some little bits with it. I have, I, I'm talking, I'm, I'm, the monitor I'm looking at is my Cintiq. Oh, okay. So I have a Cintiq that I work on more. But even that, I just I need to spend time familiarizing myself with brushes and techniques and stuff because I I use more Photoshop than I do uh, what's the uh, what's the what's the program people use to to do their comics with uh, Clip Studio Clip Studio that's yeah. it yeah and uh, I just I'm not familiar enough with it I I dabbled with it but I don't spend enough time doing yeah. it consistently daily to I, each time I go back, I have to relearn a few things. Yeah, yeah. It's there's a learning curve. Uh, the Procreate was pretty simple for me to. It was my way of getting my feet wet digitally. I didn't want to spend the money on a Cintiq and find out that I didn't like it or I couldn't handle it or whatever. So I, I did it with the iPad, and that way at least I still had an iPad and I had portability on it. The, oh yeah. Uh, the iPad Pencil is great. It's it's very organic. Um, but, uh, uh, the one drawback with the y utilizing, um, uh, procreate is that you're limited to 300 DPI, which is, which is your prints, you know, your color print, you're going to print it at 300 DPI. Uh, I didn't know that. yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't go 600. Huh. But uh, I haven't run into any problems with it. Um, you know, like when I take it my, my and I put it into a 600 DPI, because um, I work full size, so that when I put into like the print size templates that are 600 DPI, it's just a small adjustment and there's no loss of of any. So from from thumbs 
to finish. It's all on the all on the iPad. Yep. Wow. Yeah, just different layers. You know, I, I have a I scanned in a comic book page for a template, and then I just use that to draw on as if I was drawing it on my table. Yeah, I pr there might be five or six things I've done fully digital. That might even be an over exaggeration. Right? Um, I do like uh, working out. Maybe not my. It's weird. It's weird. I'm really comfortable doing my initial thumbs with a pencil. I just like the way it feels. Yeah, I do but too. A lot of times I will scan those really like ridiculously loose thumbs in and start that as my first layer to do comp roughs where I build up to a layer and then print that out to do traditional stuff from there. But I do like that ease of portability, moving stuff, elements around to get the right balance and everything. You get a lot more flexibility that way with the, whether it's the iPad or the, and I've done a lot of my layouts and stuff on the iPad. But. David has a question for you. If you could have an inker ink you from yesteryear, dead or alive, who would it be and why? That's a great question. Um, ink me. Hmm. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you that when I got the first issue of Daredevil that was inked by Williamson and colored by Christy Shield, is it okay to admit this? I, I, I won't be accused of being a, well, I won't say it. Uh, I cried. I cried. I just couldn't believe that I, you know, because I was five or six years into my career. And it's like a book came out that, like, I, I thought it could look like. I just wanted, you know, it was a just an awesome feeling. Mm -hmm. it was, uh, and she was great. Christy, Max, whatever she goes by. But, and that was with the uh, the limited palette there. The, but who would I, I? I mean, I guess the other name that popped into my head was I would love to be by Busema. <laughs> I know he's an ink other people I, that I know of, but um, I'd like to see what you could do with it. But, uh, there's two guys I'd like to see. Uh, I'd like to have been inked by Frank Giacoya. Oh, Frank's unbelievable. Yeah, I'd love to. It, nobody looked bad when Giacoya inked them. So uh, I'd love to see Frank Giacoya ink me and uh, uh, John Romita. Yeah. You know, it's it, just a little thing about Giacoya and FF because he inked one of those in Busena's first run. There's a, a issue that Giacoya inked. I just remember the splash page is the FF in front of a judge, you know. It, 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 and uh, at the time that came out, anything that didn't look like Synod inks was a little jarring to me. So th I didn't like it as much. Um, I think I also think FF is one of those books that because Synod was the thread that ran through for so many years, it was the closest thing to like Mickey Mouse that Marvel had. Where it had to look, you know what I mean? It had a look that was so this one way because of Joe Sinnott, whether that ran through Ramita, ran through right. uh, Kirby, Ramita, uh, so. But uh, then after I was on this journey, I went back and looked at that issue. I'm like, oh my gosh, Giacoya, you know, I, I did the drawing in it. And, and you, you, you know that Busan was notorious for uh, crazy about anchors, like just. Yeah, he didn't like, and he like when he turned the pencils and be done with it. He just wouldn't want to. But I've read interviews or seen an interview with him where I, I know he loved Tom. But I mean, who doesn't love Tom Palmer's? Oh yeah, what a career Tom has had. Oh um, yeah, one of the nice guys in comics too. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And uh, he liked his brother Sal, and. Uh, and he mentioned Giacoy in particular, that he said, uh, he, he said, because he couldn't stand it when guys would change his stuff, you know. And he said, yeah, but Giacoy would change his stuff. He said, I don't care if they change it to make it better or something like that. He just you know, <laughs> said, when they change it and make it better, he said, I, you know, I, I like it. But he, he uh, that's funny. Yeah, some real great, I just didn't realize how great his drawing skills were. And still don't know nearly as much as I should about it. But 
Another guy I'd like to see, uh, or I would have liked to have seen ink me, would be um, Bob Oxner. Oh, I barely know that name, and I don't even know why. I, I don't know who, tell me who it is. Uh, Bob uh, drew uh, the most gorgeous girls. He did Angel and the Ape. Um, he did uh, uh, the Jerry Lewis comics, uh, Bob Hope comics. He was a Kurt. He inked uh, uh, Kurt Swan a lot in the seventies after oh. um, Mur Murphy Anderson, and I always liked uh, uh, Oxner's stuff better. Um, he did. So was Oxner your favorite person on Swan? Yes. Okay. Yeah, he was my favorite inker until Williamson. Williamson came on in the eighties, and Williamson uh, was amazing on Swan. Oh, that's right. I remember that. Remember that. Yes, I do. That's when he first started inking, right? I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, when he, when, he get, when he started primarily inking. Yeah, yeah, that would have been in the 80s then, uh, because it was before the John Byrne switchover. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that stuff was amazing. Yeah, Al, he, he was incredible. And Tom Palmer. I, 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 by the time he's, he, he inked Busema, Adams, who's the, who's the third, Steranko. I don't even think he's like 30 years old and he's inked those third. I, he, he, he's, and, and Colin, I'm sorry, I forgot Colin. Oh, yeah, Colin, he's, yeah. Uh, again, I'm going to use the magic of reference, but he was a magician on Colin. He did stuff I don't understand. That's what I mean. Like I find it mysterious because how many people have tried to ink Colin? Mm -hmm. And and uh, I just saw someone posted something that Rabina inked over Colin. That was they posted it with. I'm gonna have to rethink my uh, top ten guys inking Colin. Yeah, and it was really nice. I had never seen it before. It was a Rabina page over over Colin. Yeah, but oh, um, black characters, right? Was that page with a uh... Was it like? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I've seen yeah, that. That is amazing. Very good, very good. But but Palmer, I, I, the ink looks wet. You know, mm -hmm. this big. You know, whether it's Dracula or what, the ink. It's like I feel. I'm almost afraid to touch the page because it feels so wet. Mm -hmm. You know, just the black, such luscious black, and such great contrast between. Those big, huge areas and the soft feathering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just, what he did over Colin and Adams, and I got to talk with Neil like 20 years ago, and uh, many times, but th this one particular time, where the stuff that Tom inked over him came up, and the Avengers stuff, the Kree Scroll stuff. And he made a point to say, look, he said, if you look at those pencils, because I've seen the pencils and they're phenomenal looking pencils. He says, look closely at them though. You'll see there's like two or three choices in there. He said, it, 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 Tom wasn't, Tom didn't have everything in front of him. To, he, just, he gave a lot of kudos to what Tom yeah, that's did cool. over him on, on that uh, Avenger stuff. Well, we've been on here for, uh, wow, almost uh, two hours, Lee. Oh my goodness. Is that, is that, is that good or bad or? It's the longest show I think I've ever done. <laughs> they usually run about an hour, hour and a half, something like that. Well, but, this, is, this is really great. Yeah, I'm really pleased uh, that you took the time to come on. And I know the fans are just, you know, they're biting at the bit to hear your, your words of wisdom about storytelling. And uh, uh, I really, really appreciate it. Well, I, I'm sure we share that. Is there, there are very few things as fun as talking about the craft. I, oh. I, I, it doesn't get old. It, every conversation about it helps me become better when I go to the board the next time. Whether it's just reminding me of things or I pick up new things from you. You just had a few gems tonight. How long have you had your channel? What's that? How long have you had this channel? Uh, let's see. This is my 10th show, and I do it weekly. So uh, 10 weeks. That's because I saw, I saw your subscriber count and you, and you got another one tonight um that's a that's a pretty good number for just 10 shows yeah yeah it, it's, uh, it, it's starting to to make some waves and people are starting to tune in 
I've had some great guests uh, to, to talk stuff. And I've, I've also done shows with no guests where I talked about like Roy Crane and uh, uh, Frank Robbins and uh, deconstructed their work. Uh, and, uh, and, and those are all available, right? I mean, I think go yeah. there and I'll, I'll check those out. Yeah, they're on, they're on my YouTube channel. So you can put them on, listen to them in the background while you're inking. <laughs> yeah, I'm absolutely going to do that. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think we're going to sign off, gang. Uh, thanks for everybody who who came in here. Uh, Saturday uh, Saturday morning's Western Roundup is going to be The Professionals. Uh, rent it. If you haven't seen it, it's an outstanding Western, real testosterone driving, cool. Lots of great quotes. You're going to love it. So tune in for that. And uh, working on another guest for next week, and hopefully I'll have that locked down. I can let you know pretty soon. So have a great evening, and we'll talk again soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.